Welcome to another episode of Locked on Kraken. And as always, thank you for making us your first listen of the day. On today's episode, we are going to talk about Maddie Beniers being named to the men's Olympic team that will compete on behalf of the United States in the 2022 Winter Olympics. We're going to hear from Maddie. I asked him a question at the press conference. Of course, we're also going to talk about Everly making it to the NHL All-Star Weekend and some of the controversy that's around just that selection and how I kind of feel about all All All-Star games. And we'll wrap up, of course, getting ready for the Los Kings, Los Angeles Kings over the weekend. That and more on this episode, Friday edition of Locked on Kraken. You are Locked On Kraken, your daily podcast on the Seattle Kraken, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We are the Seattle Kraken. Hello again, listeners. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Locked On Kraken. I am your host, Erica Lindsay Ayala, and I... I did something I don't normally do. I watched ESPN's The Point, and I did a live stream at the same time. Before I do that, let me skip through the timeline. We're not going to go chronological, so obviously I went live first. But after, immediately after I went live, I got to partake in the press conference hosted by USA Hockey. And Maddie Beneers was one of two players that was introduced to media and available to media Nathan Smith of Minnesota State University, for anyone who was on there, he he had his uh, Minnesota State University hat on, loved that. But, um, you know, he was the other player. But for this episode of Locked on Kraken, we're going to stick with our boy, Maddie Benear. So first, I'll take you to hearing from him. Also, um, hear from the GM of the men's team just a little bit about what went into picking and why they went on with a college-dominant roster. I think we kind of can all figure that one out, but you'll still hear from the GM. And then you'll hear Maddie's opening remarks as well as him answering my question about who were the first group of people that he told when he officially got the news that he was going to the Olympics. Here we go. Yeah, I mean, I'm just so honored, um, humbled, excited uh, for this experience to play for the Olympic team. It's kind of something. Every kid growing up, you know, you're a hockey player, you watch Miracle, you watch the Olympic Olympics every every time you get a chance. And um, just being named to this team is obviously just such an honor. I'm so excited and I uh, can't wait to get started, you know, with these teammates, with these coaches and, um, you know, hopefully bring back your gold. Thanks, Chris. And, um, you know, I think the number one thing that we were looking at is just being 200-foot players as a forward, uh, being able to defend as a defenseman and um, the strength and goal of being athletic and um, you know having as much experience as we can for young individual players. And um, we know that these players all have speed, tenacity and aggressiveness, uh, which is uh, gonna be the style of play that we that built this team around. Uh, Eric Ayala with Locked on Kraken. I look forward to catching up with you, hopefully, in Beijing. But I wanted to ask you, um, when did you find out uh, that you officially made the Olympic roster? And uh, who were some of the first people that you spoke to about it? Um, yeah, I found out with uh, two of my teammates, uh, Brock Paver and Jake Sanderson. It was pretty, it was pretty uh, cool moment. You know, John, John told us, and we are pretty excited and I don't think we could stop smiling the rest of the night um but I immediately just went upstairs and I called my parents uh I think I actually I called them each individually and said you guys need to answer this group FaceTime call right now and I I was like no I'm doing something I was like no you need to answer this and then uh, I told them all together so it was a pretty cool experience um and they were all just kind of going crazy like are you serious um so yeah that's kind of how it went down I love that. Maddie Beneers, every time I've heard him speak with the media, he's always smiling, having a good time. It was good to see him. I'm very thankful that 
on the women's side of stuff, actually, that I have been in communication with USA Hockey for the last handful of years. And so our good man, David Fisher, he um, allowed me to ask Maddie Veneers a question or a bunch of media members on. So I'm very grateful for that. And Fish, uh, as we call him for short, will be the liaison for the men's team. So I am going to be working with David Fisher to try and get Matty Beneers. And uh, hopefully right here on Locked on Kraken, we can talk about his experience, uh, or I should say the experience of the U.S. men's team through the eyes of Matty Beneers. But here's what I had to say when it comes to whether I think Matty Beneers is the overall face of USA Hockey. Okay, here, bam, thank you for the USA Hockey. Maddie Beneers, named to the U.S. Olympic roster. Look at that. First one up, currently playing college hockey at Michigan, cracking second overall pick in 2021. It's officially official. Bow, 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 bow. Maddie Beneers. Wow. Okay, so right now what we're seeing is they're listing out the goaltenders. They're listing out the defensemen. The only image that we've seen of action shots has been of Matty Beneers. So for our purposes, that is so cool, right? You know? Now, when I think about things like equity, right, and what we're talking about and it being a special moment, this is not a special moment for everyone. And that makes me sad. You're representing the United States. We in the United States, we say that that is supposed to be the highest honor. And yet, we don't give respect. I can't tell you what they're saying because, again, I have it muted, so I'll have to watch that back. But um, only Maddie Beneers. Only Maddie Beneers. Oh, boy. So this guy, Quinn, now is on the screen. <sighs> There is, um, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> is Maddie Beneers, hold on, let me get this out of here because I want everyone to see it even after. Maddie Beneers is the face of USA Hockey? Well, I'm glad that you asked. I think he definitely, uh, especially because he's the number two draft pick and the number one draft pick does not is not eligible to play for the United States. So in that, in as such, yes, Maddie Beneers is probably the face of the men's team. But in my humble opinion, if Maddie Beneers gets more ink, gets more coverage, then a four-time Olympian gold medalist, three-time silver medalist, uh, that's probably a problem. Respectfully to Maddie Beneers, he hasn't won a national championship in the NCAA multiple people on the women's team have respectfully to Maddie Beneers. He has not won a gold medal at the Olympics. Multiple returners probably to the sled hockey team have a Olympic gold medal as well as the women's team. So is he the face of USA hockey? No, I do think that still belongs to Hillary Knight. So again, that was from yesterday. I think we got to slow the roll a little bit, just a little bit, calling Matt Beneers the face. But uh, he's he's got a good face. He's got a good smile. And uh, I think he's going to do great things for Team USA and, of course, eventually for the Seattle Kraken. But coming up next, I want to recap yesterday's game um, against St. Louis. There were some great things in the game. There were some very cracking on brand things that happened in, in the game, including just the overall frustration, eight straight losses. We're going to talk about that. And then at the end of the show, I'll get you ready for the game against the Los Angeles Kings coming up this weekend. And on Monday, we will actually do a recap. We were going to do a preview squad cast, but um, had some technical issues uh, with our good friend, Sarah Avampato, who is the host of Locked on Kings. So no worries. We're flexible. We're in nothing but flexible here on Locked on Kraken. So coming up next week, we'll uh, do a squad cast with Sarah. So if you have questions for Sarah or about the Los Angeles Kings, make sure you send them my way. I'll tell you how to do that. But right now, let me tell you about Built Bar. You know that I always keep Built Bar handy. It's uh, the new year and it's all about those new year's resolutions. And for me, at least, 
that's about thinking more mindfully about how I fuel myself between doing a daily podcast, I'm going to be heading over to Beijing, China, and all of the other things that I do. It is really important that I stay well fueled. You know, it's kind of like there's certain vehicles that you have to put diesel fuel into. You can't just put the regular stuff in. And Built Bar at 130 calories with only four grams of sugar while also having about 17 grams of protein is one of the things that I can add to my daily intake to make sure that I'm fueling up correctly. So here's an idea for the new year and something actually that I'm doing just overall uh, is really doing an inventory of some of the things that I snack on and just things like that and replace them with things like a built Bar that will give you all of the nutrients you need while still tasting absolutely delicious. There's so many flavors to choose from, salted caramel, mint brownie, I love double chocolate, raspberry, peanut butter brownie, uh, I, you know, I could go on and on and on. Um, but we want you to make sure you're fueling yourself in the proper way. So when you use promo code locked 15, you will get 15% off at built.com. So stash up whatever you want, your favorite flavors, and even some of their supplements that you can put into drinks and you can just get your protein that way. If you head to built.com and you use promo code locked 15, you will get 15% on your next order. Happy snacking and happy fueling. All right, folks, we're going to talk about the two to one loss to St. Louis. Now, if you remember from yesterday's show, um, I was talking, um, if you remember from yesterday's show, I did talk about the St. Louis blues and I talked about how we're essentially the exact opposite of St. Louis in basically every category. And so I wouldn't be surprised if the game got a little bit out of hand. That actually didn't happen. I did say yesterday though, that I kind of like Drieger. I like how the Seattle Kraken play with Drieger in net. And oh baby, I saw what's happening on Seattle crack in Twitter. And there is definitely a house divided when it comes to this. Now, am I saying that Drieger is going to save the season? No. And even, I don't even think mathematically that that's possible, but I am not the math whiz. I will uh, leave that to th those who are anyway. Um, <laughs> You know, is it going to save the season? Maybe not. But even this loss, overall, a two to one loss to a team that now is 22, 10, and five from a team that's 10, 24, and four. I'll take that. They held the St. Louis Blues scoreless in the first two frames and scored the first goal. So these are the things that I like. Also, our good man, Chris Drieger. You know, he had a 0.926 save percentage. Now, honestly, when I looked at the saves that he actually got credit for, I was like, what the heck is going on? It feels like he did a lot more work than making um, just 19 even strength saves. Overall had 27 uh, shots that he personally faced and 25 of those 27 uh, he was able to put away or push away, I should say. Um, but that's because something that I really liked when it came to the stats is that the Seattle Kraken had 14 blocked shots, 14 blocked shots to the St. Louis Blues, six blocked shots. So that's great. That is absolutely great. That to me shows progress. If we just take a look at that, that being said, the Seattle Kraken slipped no power play goals. Jonas Donskoy had a really great opportunity shorthanded. And oh my gosh, it was just, Huso had a, an amazing save. It was an amazing save. For some of you who know my calling of women's hockey, it is a phrase that I have coined. He saved it with the tippiest of toes. It was such a great move by Donskoy. And Huso just made a great play. You can't do anything about that. But Here's what Chris Drieger had to say after the game. I also want you to hear what Dave Haxtell had to say about Chris Drieger. I, yeah, just like what goes on in your mind in a game like this where you guys have the lead and then they score two kind of in the third period. You had a strong game, strong second period, and then the result happens like this. Just like what goes on in your mind? Yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking about the next phase. Um, 
obviously they got the two quick there off the bat uh, in the third, which is frustrating. But um, you know, once those goes go in, you just have to focus on the next save and give the guys a chance to win. Um, so that's where my head's at. Coach, what did you see from Chris Drieger that you liked tonight? It seems like he kind of kept you guys in this game a little bit more. Well, he did his job. You know, I thought he did his job well. He gave us a chance to win. Um, you know, scoring opportunities tonight, I'm guessing, you know, as I look at it, are going to be pretty close. Uh, when you look at the shot attempts, uh, zone time, everything, um, you know, it's it's a pretty even hockey game. So Chris did a good job in giving us and, and putting us in an opportunity or in a situation to go into a third period with a lead. Um, and, you know, there was a couple of big saves along the way, uh, especially in the first couple of periods. Uh, there was a tip in the first period that, uh, you know, that was uh, a high tip that he was seeing and he was on it. And, you know, his reaction time was really good on it. So um, he was, you know, he was sound in, uh, you know, in his role tonight. So you walk away from a game like that. I mean, what, what is your feeling personally? Obviously, it's got to be just plain to lose, but you look and I mean, you know, it was a good game for you. I mean, how do you feel after a game like that? What's what are your emotions right now? Uh, just frustrated, you know, um, you can never really feel happy after losing a game. Um, kind of, you know, it's a team effort and I don't think anyone's satisfied, um, you know, without getting, without getting two points. So we're just in, um, we're in one of those stretches where we, we got to figure out a way to win. You know, we're going into three periods up and, um, and giving them away. So, um, yeah, I think we need to do a little bit of soul searching here and, and, uh, you know, find a way to get the job done. Yeah, like I said, it's just, it's frustrating. Um, you know, it's a competitive group of guys in there and myself included, like we just want to win, you know, we're, we're, we're playing a game that we love and, and it's no fun losing. So, um, and it's, it's tough. It seems like the games were, we're in the games and it's just these key moments that keep slipping away from us. So, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not like we were out of that game tonight. I thought we, I thought we played well and, um, maybe got into a little penalty trouble, but, um, yeah, I mean, and, and I'm to blame for that as well. I mean, I, I took a tripping penalty there. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't remember really what I did with my stick, but regardless, um, you know, we got to stay out of the box. And and if you give a team a power play like that, that many chances they're going to get one. So um, we just got to find ways to, to come together as a group and, and uh, you know, find a way to get to get some wins here. All right. So that's the good stuff, more or less. But as Chris alluded to, as Dave alluded to, this is still a loss. It's the eighth straight loss. And what makes this difficult for me is if the Seattle Kraken play this game outside of the context of everything else that's been going on, yeah, it's a loss. Do I think it's a bad loss? No, absolutely not. We've seen some gnarly losses, and this isn't one of them. However, it's the eighth consecutive loss. So when you compound all of that, you really can't take this game for just what it is, unfortunately. And this is what Dave Haxtell had to say about that when um, it was Marissa and Jemmy asked a question. And you have we have heard, because I've played it right here on Locked on Kraken, sometimes we do hear the guy saying it's one little mistake, one little mistake, one little mistake. So, you know, Marissa asked that question, hey, is this one little mistake? What's going on? And I actually like what Dave Haxtell had to say. Oh, I don't think it's one mistake. You know, we uh, – you know, throw it a hockey game. I mean, it's, there's, there's, uh, ups and downs and there's mistakes that happen, uh, throughout the hockey game, you know, um, tonight hard fought, um, you know, and, you know, our specialty teams on the PK side did a real good job. Um, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the fifth minor penalty is, uh, you know, that's a turning point in the hockey game. Um, and, you know, we weren't able to get that kill. So that one, you know, that can't happen. Um, but I'm not going to put the whole hockey game, you know, just on that play. So uh, that's, you know, at that time of game to take the fifth one, 200 feet away from our, uh, you know, from our net cannot happen. Um, you know, and that, uh, you know, that turned the game their direction um, at, at that point in time. I think Dave's absolutely right. Sure. You know, the trip up and taking a penalty at the wrong time. I told you that the Seattle Kraken were 0 for 3 on the power play. The St. Louis Blues, they scored the game winning goal on a power play five minutes um, into the third period. And that out of five power play opportunities, that was the only time that they scored. So the Seattle Kraken had been good on the penalty kill, but 
they just couldn't sustain the pressure from that final PK. So I agree with Dave in as much as it's not just the one thing. Again, in this game, there were so many other things that they did better that in this game, I could see the tendency to want to say, oh, it's just that one little thing. Just that one little thing. It's not one thing that has them on an eight-game eight skid. It's not. It's definitely not. Including, I will be honest, it's not just one goaltender. You heard Chris Drieger say, you know, I, I'm the one, you know, I don't know what I did with my stick. You know, you think things happen. Hockey games happen. Bodies are moving everywhere. So do I think Chris Drieger is the answer? No. There's a lot of things that the Seattle Kraken need to do. I do think he's earned more starts. And for the sake of keeping someone who we have on contract for the next, what, five seasons, I guess, well, four more seasons, I kind of think it would be nice to maybe shield Philip Grubauer from having to take the brunt of the rest of the schedule that he's done because Drieger has not always been healthy and Grubauer is presumed to be the starting netminder. At this point in the season, for the sake of not wanting to have Grubauer be hurt, to make sure that he can have time to mentally rest and maybe even, you know, reintegrate himself into this team. Because I keep saying it, the chemistry with Grubauer and the rest of the team doesn't seem to be clicking for me. It does click when Drieger's there. I'm just saying, that's my eye test. So I'd be fine to see more games for Drieger, and we need him too. You know, we need him to have that confidence. Um, again, when Gruby hasn't been able to finish a game or when he was dealing with some stuff, it's not been Drieger. <laughs> you know, Joey Decord probably has as many games as Drieger at this point. So I want to see Drieger get more time in net. I think that you have to do something different. And um, insisting that Philip Grubauer is your starting netminder when you have Philip Drieger – or excuse me, <laughs> excuse me, um, presuming that Philip Grubauer is your starting net minder when Chris Drieger is right there, I think you got to let go of that at this point in the season. I really, really do. So we'll see what happens. Um, but coming up next, we're going to get you ready for Saturday's game. It, the, the Seattle Kraken are going to be on a homestand, and it starts with one of our Pacific rivals, the – Los Angeles Kings. Bet Online would like to wish you a happy betting new year as we continue to march to the All Star break in NHL and to the playoffs in football. Remember, Bet Online remains your number one spot for the best sports wagering in 2022. And because of that, you can head over on your mobile device, your laptop, your desktop, whatever you got. And when you sign up, this is on your first deposit, so it has to be your first deposit. But when you sign up for the first time using promo code Locked On, you will get a 50-50% welcome bonus on that first deposit from football, basketball, boxing, and of course hockey, and even your favorite Las Vegas casino games. Don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for 2022. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to wager on all your favorite sports. Bet online where the game starts. The game starts for the Seattle Kraken. I should say it restarts for the Seattle Kraken at Climate Pledge Arena on Saturday as they take on the Los Angeles Kings. We'll then see Chicago, the San Jose Sharks, and these very St. Louis Blues, again, at Climate Pledge Arena as part of that homestand I was talking about. The Los Angeles Kings, they come in at 19, 13, and 5, again to the Seattle Krakens, 10, 22, and 4. Now, here is something interesting. This is a, someone that we see in the Pacific Division. They're in that three spot, that three spot that I had predicted that Seattle had within reach. It's seeming quite far off right now. But the Los Angeles Kings are in that third spot spot in the division. Excuse me. Okay, so we're going to take on the Los Angeles Kings. Their record is 19-13-5 and five to our 10-22-4. and four. In the last 10 games, they are on a 7-3-0 and oh streak. Uh, three of those wins consecutive where we 
are one, seven, and five straight. It's it's not great. It's not great. Uh, here we go. We are 19th on the power play to their 25th. So this is actually a place where the Seattle Kraken have the advantage. We are 25th in the PK at the PK. They are at a 75.5 clip on the PK for 26th overall in the league. Now here's the thing. Goals four, they are at a 2.81 clip. That's their average goals per game. We're at a 2.72 clip. That's our average goals per game. Now here's where the gap widens. 2.57 is what they allow. 2.57 goals per game. We allow 3.67 goals per game. So I'm going to be looking at those uh, saves. I'm going to be looking at blocked shots because it has to be all in defensively to really bring that number down. Um, I want to see, I keep saying the same players because it's true. We need some of our dynamic, gritty players to start scoring. Yanni Gord, Ryan Donato, Jared McCann is doing his thing. You know, uh, we've got Eberly, who is the first ever Seattle Kraken player named to an NHL All-Star Weekend. Congratulations to Jordan Eberly, but we might get another. Mark Giordano himself, the captain, the captain, is uh, one of the men that is uh, up for the fan vote. They're calling it the last man, the last men in. And as far as I'm concerned, Mark Giordano, why the heck not? It's it's hard when you're a team that's not doing great uh, to get these uh, all-star nods. Although, all-star games in sports are really just becoming ridiculous. No one can agree if it's supposed to be to grow the game or is it the best on the best. No one agrees. Um, it's to the point where I'm just like, just give them the break. You know, another thing, the NHL has these strict rules where if you are voted in and you opt not to go, then you're fined. These guys want a break. Maybe a little bit different in a season that's been so plagued by COVID, which, though, is another thing. Why the heck are we having an all-star break when you don't even have all of the games that you had on the schedule rescheduled yet? What the heck are we doing? That seems so wild to me. It seems insane to me but I'm not the NHL commissioner. That is a job for Gary Bettman and he has made his decision. So yeah, that's all I have to say about that. Coming up on Monday, as I, as I said, we're going to have Sarah Avampato. I will be traveling. So just note that you'll see a little bit of a change. I, uh, I'm not going to Beijing just yet. I have two work trips. Then I go, um, to my family home in New York. And then from there, it's off to Beijing. But I mentioned I will be helping out with the Black Hockey History Mobile Museum. I will be going to Kimberly Sass's art exhibition hosted by MSG. That's going to be really exciting on the 30th. I'll leave the links in the show notes for all of that. And of course, I will be keeping up with our good man, Maddie Beneers, as he gets ready with the United States men's Olympic team to head over to China. Uh, I didn't get into it too much, but next week I'll also break down what that logistically is going to look like, because I know personally I'm having so many challenges getting things nailed down logistically. And it sounds like USA hockey is having to amend things in ways that they normally wouldn't have to. So I'll break all of that down because your host of locked on Kraken is going to Beijing to cover the men's and women's Olympic tournaments live. Who else can you say is doing that? On the Locked On Network, it's just your girl, Erica Lindsay Ayala. And for that, I thank you for holding fast and staying true, not just for the Seattle Kraken, but for Locked On Kraken. And I'm hoping that we can come up with a great content calendar for you from Beijing, uh, and it's going to be a great time. So as always, hold fast, stay true, and on Saturday, we all say together, let's go Kraken. Have a great weekend. <laughs>